Hi everybody, I'm Susan Mulvihill. Welcome back to our vegetable garden. We live in Spokane, Washington, which is located about 300 miles east of Seattle, and the hardiness zone ranges from 5B to 6A. Today is a beautiful day, a perfect one for planting carrots, parsnips, beets, and Swiss chard. Now I know a lot of folks struggle with growing root crops, especially carrots. Usually what happens is they get all this wonderful leafy growth and puny little roots. Well, I've got all kinds of tips to help you avoid that and you will have your best harvest ever. Earlier this year, I shot a video that's called Fertilizer Basics. And I'm going to be sure to add a link to it in the description that goes along with this video on my YouTube channel. If you have not watched that video, I strongly encourage you to do so. And that's because you need to understand what the nutritional needs of different types of vegetable crops are. And if you use the wrong type of fertilizer or soil amendment, it makes a huge difference in what you end up harvesting at the end of the season. So let me give you two examples. I get a lot of emails from folks who grew carrots for the first time, and they said, all I got was a whole bunch of leaves and puny little roots. What's up with that? Well, the thing with root crops, such as carrots and parsnips and beets, is that they need a lot of phosphorus. Phosphorus promotes root growth and also blooming and setting fruit. I also get emails from folks saying, I grew tomatoes and the plants look fantastic. They were just so lush and beautiful but they hardly produced any tomatoes. What's up with that? So again, phosphorus is the key in these instances because phosphorus promotes that root development and or the blooming and setting of fruit on a plant. So in the case of carrots, which I'm about to plant, they really need a good soil amendment that contains a lot of phosphorus. And so I'm going to use bone meal. So here's a package of bone meal. And this one's actually fish bone meal, basically the same thing, just made differently. And you'll notice there are three numbers on the package. There will always be three numbers on fertilizer packages. So this represents, in this order, the percentage of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium within this particular product. Since the middle number is the highest one, you know that is high in phosphorus. Now I know you're anxious for me to get the carrot seeds planted, but I have a few other things I wanted to let you know so you have the best success possible. First of all, if you add manure to the bed, and that is high in nitrogen, so remember you don't want to do that, it will cause the roots to fork and split. You don't want that to happen to your carrots or your parsnips if you're growing them. Another thing you need to know is that they do best in more of a sandy type of a soil, and I think that's because it's easier for those roots to push down through it as they're growing. If you have really rocky soil, you might want to consider growing your carrots in containers, but the main thing is to really loosen the soil in your planting bed. Now normally, I like to advocate minimal disturbance of the soil, but in the case of carrots and parsnips, you really want them to be able to push into that soil, and so I have loosened this quite a bit. So now I want to add the bone meal. Whenever you add any kind of a soil amendment or fertilizer, be sure to always follow the label directions. More is not better. And besides, you're wasting money if you use more than what is effective. So I'm just sprinkling the bone meal on the surface and then I'm going to rake it into the soil. And I'm raking it into the top three inches of the soil. Because we use drip irrigation, I just put the setup on top of the bed. And this one's a little unusual, so don't be distracted by this. We will have some potato grow bags outside the bed, and that's what these extra lines are for. So now the nice thing 
is that I can use these runs of drip tape to figure out where my furrows will go. I'm going to plant three rows of carrots and one row of parsnips. So here are the seeds I'm going to be planting today. In the carrot department, I've got Rainbow Blend, which I thought would be a fun variety to grow this year. Chantenay Short Stuff, I grew those last year and they're wonderful. And Scarlet Nantes, which is a tried and true favorite for us. In the parsnip department, I'm growing Harris Model, which is the same variety I grew last year. Now, funny I should mention that because these are last year's seeds. And what you need to know is that parsnip seeds have a very short shelf life of roughly a year that you will get great germination rates. Well, there are hundreds of seeds in this packet and I am not throwing that away. So what I'm going to do is plant the seeds more thickly in the hopes of getting great germination and then I'll be very good about thinning, which I'm gonna talk about later because that is the key to giving plants enough room to grow those wonderful roots. You can see that I've made my four furrows and that I have labeled what each row will have planted in it. And then I'm just going to sprinkle the seeds into the furrow, which you won't be able to see because they're so little. Now carrot and parsnip seeds need to be planted at about a quarter inch depth. So once I have these seeds all planted, I'll cover them over so they have about a quarter inch worth of soil over them. This is what parsnip seeds look like and I forgot that they can be planted up to one half inch depth. So I just wanted to correct that for you. Now I'm gonna water everything in and then I have the coolest tip to share with you that made all the difference in our carrots last year. My goal is to have the soil lightly moist so that the soil and the seeds make good contact with each other. And it might look like I'm giving them a whole lot of water, but these beds have not been watered other than by Mother Nature over the last few months. That looks good. Now this is something that I learned from my friend Joe Lample, and what a difference it made in the germination rate of the carrots. So this is just a sheet of burlap. I bought some undyed burlap from our local Joann's store. And once you have watered the soil, you want to cover the soil with the burlap and pin it down so that it won't blow away. This is the same piece of burlap that I used last year and I figure if I'm only using it for this purpose and then I store it down in our basement, it'll last for years. So now what? Leave the burlap in place for about 10 days, then carefully remove it, let it dry off, and then store it for next year. And the seeds should start germinating like you wouldn't believe. Now there's another step that you need to know about and it is so important you need to thin your seedlings once they get to be two to three inches high. You want to thin them so they are about three inches apart. And the reason for this is you're giving the roots enough room to grow normally, and that's the goal, right? Unfortunately, you cannot just replant the ones that you pulled up while you were thinning your carrots. The reason for that is any time the root hairs on carrot plants get damaged, the roots will not grow normally. So you need to just put them in the compost pile and that's all there is to it. But thinning the carrots is definitely the key to having nice roots. I almost forgot to share a really great carrot growing tip with you. If in past years you've had problems with carrot rust flies or carrot root flies as they're also known, there is one more step you can do to protect your crop from them. So it turns out that the adult flies are not able to fly higher than the top of the foliage on carrot plants. So if you erect a taller barrier around your planting, as soon as you plant the seeds, 
that will keep them away. You can keep the top of the barrier open, just bring it up high enough so that it's above the height of what your foliage would be. And this will work really great. So I've got two photos to share with you that are both from my book, The Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook, so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Now, let's get those beets and Swiss chard planted. This is the bed where I'm going to plant the Swiss chard and beets. And they're going under a cover because beet family crops, which are beets, spinach, and Swiss chard, are very susceptible to an annoying insect called the leaf miner. The adult is a fly. It lays eggs on the leaves. The maggots hatch and tunnel through the leaves, basically ruining them. And then they drop down to the soil they pupate and later emerge as adult flies to start the whole cycle all over again. So by planting them under a cover, whether you use floating row cover, which is also commonly known as reme, or under an agricultural insect netting, which is what I've got on this bed, I am creating a barrier to keep those leaf miners away from my plant. And one thing I wanted to mention is when you're growing beets, don't forget that in addition to those roots being tasty, the leaves are absolutely delicious when you steam them. So here are the seeds I'm going to be planting. For beets, I'm growing cylindrical. You might also see them listed as cylindra. And then I'm going to grow Swiss chard. The variety is garden rainbow. And those leaves are going to be so beautiful and tasty. So you'll notice this bed has a hinged row cover lid, which is pretty darn cool. And this is a do-it-yourself project from my book, The Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook. And in the description of this video on YouTube, I'll put a link to it on Amazon, or you can certainly check it out from your local library branch. But this is extremely handy. I've already prepared the bed, just in the interest of saving time. So I'm growing one row of Swiss chard and two rows of beets. I knew the beets would need some bone meal, so that's what I added into that area of the bed. And then I used an organic fertilizer that had a lot of nitrogen in it for the Swiss chard so that it can grow lots of wonderful leaves. I'm going to make my furrows for planting the seeds in. Both the Swiss chard and the beet seeds need to be planted about one half inch deep. So that's for Swiss chard. And then I'll do a row here. And a row here for the beets. I wanted to show you what beet and Swiss chard seeds look like. They are actually clusters of seeds, but don't worry, you don't have to separate them. Now, just like with the carrot seeds, I'm going to put the seeds into the furrow. And in the case of the beet seeds, I like to space them about an inch or so apart. And then once again, I will thin them as needed. Cover over your seeds and water them in. And of course, I want to cover the bed to keep those insects out. Now, earlier I mentioned that you could use floating row cover as a way to keep leaf miners away from beets, spinach, and Swiss chard. So here's an example of some floating row cover that I have on a different bed. And actually, in this case, I'm trying to keep our local quail, a type of bird, away from the newly sprouted fava bean seedlings that will soon be popping up in here. And so it's just for that purpose while the seedlings are really small. But what I've got under here are some hoops. And you can make hoops from all kinds of things. In this case, this is from 
black poly sprinkler pipe and then drape the floating row cover over the top of it and be sure to weight it down so it won't blow away in the wind. I've got a bonus tip for you today and then we're all done. I wanted to talk with you about the importance of hardening off any seedlings you may have started indoors before you officially transplant them out in your garden. If you take your plants straight from your house and plant them out in your garden without putting them through the hardening off process, which I'll explain in a moment, the plants are at risk of getting sunburned. Now you might think, oh, that's not a big deal, but it can actually kill the plants or it can seriously set them back. And you want your plants to do great and not have a setback at the start of their growing season. So here is what hardening off means. First of all, no matter whether you used natural light indoors or plant lights, that amount of light is nowhere near the intensity of actual sunlight. I mean, right now it is blazingly hot and bright. <laughs> but what you do is slowly but surely acclimate them to the intensity of the sun. And this is over the course of about a week. What you do is you bring them outside, you put them in a semi-shady area for one hour, only one hour, and then move them back indoors. On the second day, you do the same thing, but for two hours, and then move them back indoors. And then over the course of the rest of the week, each day you're having them outside for an hour longer, and you are slowly but surely moving them into actual full sunlight. By the end of that week's time, they will be acclimated to the sunlight. You can plant them out into the garden and they will hit the ground running. Thanks so much for watching today, everybody. Happy gardening.